Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Around the Empire is independent media. You can pitch in at patreon.com slash around the empire or at paypal.me slash around the empire pod. You can find these links on our website, aroundtheempire.com. Dan Kaval joins us today to talk about the situation in Venezuela. U.S. officials and almost all media outlets have made claims about the illegitimacy of the Venezuelan presidential election last May and used that claim to recognize a little-known opposition leader, Juan Guaido, as the new interim president, replacing President Nicolas Maduro. Dan begs to differ with that characterization, having witnessed the election process up close while he was on the ground in Venezuela as an election monitor. He shares that experience with us today and many other insights on the country, the region, the media coverage and politics of it here in the United States. Daniel Kavalik is a labor and human rights lawyer, a lifelong peace activist, an author, and a college professor. He teaches international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. The Christian Science Monitor described him as, quote, one of the most prominent defenders of Colombian workers in the United States, unquote, in reference to his work defending Colombian unionists under the threat of assassination. He's the recipient of the Project Censored Award for his work exposing the killing of trade unionists in Colombia. He's done interviews and written articles for many different media, including Counterpunch and the Huffington Post. And he's recently written three books, including the latest one, The Plot to Control the World, How the U.S. Spent Billions to Change the Outcome of Elections Around the World, which was published last November. This interview was recorded on February 5th, 2019. Dan Kavalik, welcome to Around the Empire. Thanks so much for coming to talk to us today. Thank you. So, Dan, it's curious because the more I learn about your background and um, read about you, you know, you're basically, I think it would be hard to find another person that has more experience on this topic than you. So why am I not seeing you on CNN and MSNBC and Fox at every cable channel, every radio show, every day? Well, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, and it's been, it's certainly not for lack of trying, <laughs> by the way. I have yeah. books out and I, I even hired a publicist to help with that sort of thing and it's very difficult to get mainstream interviews and I think you know because the narrative that's being you know presented on things like Venezuela and Nicaragua and Syria and other hot spots is pretty sewn up it's a very one-sided narrative and those who have a different view of what's going on are, are basically shut out of the mainstream media uh Chomsky Noam Chomsky you know, talked about that for many years, you know, how he, you know, never, you know, was interviewed for the New York Times, uh, was never on NPR, believe it or not. Um, that is unbelievable. He said the only mainstream show that ever gave him uh, any time was, uh, uh, ironically, uh, William F. Buckley's uh, Crossfire on, on PBS, which would have him on. From time to time, he viewed Buckley, at least as an honest intellectual, willing to debate and talk about things. But outside of that, you know, Chomsky is rarely ever heard in, in mainstream sources, even though he's very famous, he's well known, he's well respected. But it just shows that, you know, there there's especially on foreign policy issues, there's one narrative and and uh, you can't uh, break break that narrative, essentially. So basically they don't reach out to you and you actually try reaching out to them and they just ignore you or decline. Yeah, absolutely. The only mainstream, I, I had one mainstream interview and that was on immigration and that was on Laura Ingram's show on Fox last summer. Out of the years I've been doing this, I got a five minute interview. But yeah, no, I work very hard and my publicist works very hard to get me on to any any show that will have me essentially and and it's virtually none that will so 
Now, on the other hand, I see your interviews and articles in numerous alternative or independent media. So thank God for that. But it, I find it really interesting that a foremost expert, someone who's been there on the ground, um, is not being heard at all. Now, I guess, you know, we're not really surprised, but it's one of those things where you're still shocked, but not surprised. You know, there's there's this feeling that I, I you know, I feel practically every day in this country where it's stunning, you know, it, it, just how far we fall. Now, you've been in this field for some decades now, right? So yes, have you in the past, same thing? Is this one of the topics that has always been this way or have you seen it become even worse recently? Uh, I, I think it's gotten worse. Um, I think particularly in the 80s, uh, when I look back then uh, to the war in Central America, I think there was more ability, there was more debate within the mainstream media about about the wars in Central America, about the Contra War in Nicaragua, for example, about the war in El Salvador. Certainly there was, you know, even then, obviously, a fairly tight narrative on those things. And you had people like Robert Bonner at the New York Times who ended up losing his job there over his coverage on El Salvador. But still there was some debate about it, and certainly enough debate that it, it impacted policy, you know, that Congress twice cut off aid to the Contras because there was some discussion in the media about Contra atrocities and whatnot. And so, of course, Reagan had to turn to the Iran-Contra scandal to fund uh, the Contras. But the point is there was some debate in the mainstream press about what was happening there. Now there's none. I mean, there's just none. And every time you hear – and I tend to listen to NPR just because I like radio, though I don't like NPR, but I do like radio, so I tend to have it on during the news hours. And what you always notice – if they cover Venezuela, they'll interview one or two people who speak English, number one. OK, so that's going to narrow the range of people that they're, they're going to interview down there. And they're always opposition people. Yeah. You know, six, six million people voted for Maduro last May. Six million people. They can't find one person uh, to speak in, in, you know, in support of him. Well, of course they could, but they don't want to. They really want to present only the other side you know and and so that's the only side you get so and that is how again to quote chomsky and edward s herman that's how consent is manufactured a couple things happen so not only is it a one-sided story on venezuela but it's also an obsessive concentration on a country like venezuela where the u.s wants regime change I was just talking to a friend who's a reporter at Reuters yesterday about this. So one, again, the story here is one-sided, but also if one steps back, one has to ask, why am I always hearing about Venezuela in the news every single day? And I don't hear about Colombia, where 150 social leaders have been killed in the last year. Why aren't I hearing about the current... Uh, military foray into the Brazilian rainforest by the new right-wing president who's now attacking indigenous people to steal their land. Why aren't I hearing about the uh, human rights violations, the many human rights violations committed uh, by the coup government in Honduras? And then turning you know, to other parts of the globe, why aren't I hearing every single day about the worst humanitarian crisis in the world? And that's the U.S. Yeah. backed crime, genocide in Yemen. Right. Which you, you just started to hear a little bit about uh, when the Washington Post reporter was killed. That opened up some discussion. But to the extent you heard about it, you rarely heard the fact that the U.S. was very much behind what was happening. And now you don't hear about it at all, even though that genocide continues and so it's a very selective obsession with certain countries and again countries where the u.s wants regime change that's where the media focuses and then it's a one-sided portrayal of those countries and so it easily gets people on the bandwagon of regi regime change so much so that i think there's only like four congress people in both houses that have spoken out against intervention in Venezuela. And and I think three of the four were very half-hearted 
uh, oppositions to it, you know, yeah. where they would c- condemn Maduro and then, but say, well, but we shouldn't intervene type of thing. Yeah. First, they give the disclaimer, Maduro, bad dictator, uh, but we shouldn't, inter- you know, we shouldn't meddle. And even, you know, you, you, again, all this is even, you know, being reflected in a change in organizations that we used to trust to be more critical of U.S. policy in Latin America. For example, the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, Saul Landau came out of their very uh, famous supporter of Fidel, for example, very good on these issues. Well, they, they now... Their position on uh, Venezuela is no intervention, no Maduro, you know. So theirs is very, again, very much along mm-hmm. more mainstream lines. Yeah, um, but it's a, it's like a leveraged position, you know, they hedge. <laughs> right. In a way that they didn't uh, before. Another group that's really gone bad is, uh, is the Washington office on Latin America, WOLA, which was actually founded by Father Miguel Descoto of Nicaragua. I just learned that recently to Father Descoto, who was a you know proud till the day he died that he founded that. Well, they're now Wola is openly supporting sanctions against Nicaragua and other forms of intervention. You know, so not was another one. The uh, American Congress on Latin America, uh, which I used to really trust in terms of coverage on Latin America, and they've been terrible on Nicaragua, for example. So. I think you see, in general, a more rightward interventionist shift in general in U.S. politics. Now, for I want to get into um, more on your background, and especially if our audience doesn't already know that Dan's been on the ground observing these elections firsthand. So you're not going to find many people with that experience. But while we're on this topic of the, it seems that Marco Rubio and um, Menendez seem to be leading, uh, championing this this whole effort right now. And I mean, I don't know that much about their lobby. I know that there's a Cuban American lobby and it's very strong, particularly here in New Jersey and in New York. But I don't really know if it is an ideological thing for them or if they're what that lobby represents, who's behind them, where's the pressure and the money and the the, you know, the influence coming from and why. Yeah, the Cuban American community still has this very outside influence in U.S. politics, um, in part because, of course, uh, you know, they're based in Miami, Florida, you know, which, you know, Florida uh, being the key swing state in American politics. And so uh, they're very strategically located in a place where they have a lot of power and a lot of say over U.S. policy, particularly in regards to Latin America. Uh, now, it's true that the older generation there is dying off, of course, if not most of them already have, be given that the Cuban Revolution was in 1959. But still, and, and still that community uh, is still largely right-wing pro-U.S. intervention and, and still is is very influential through people like like Marco Rubio. And again, because they can swing a state like Florida, which can swing an entire presidential election. Now, we know that oil is at the center of the, the desire for regime change in Venezuela. And we know that, you know, it's it's a constant struggle back and forth between uh, a one percent, if you will, in particular countries that owned a lot of land and had, um, you know, the system was tilted in their favor so that they, there was a lot of wealth that flowed their way. And in the various countries where liberations or revolutions happened, uh, the resources in, in Venezuela, the, you know, the Bolivarian revolution insists that those resources be spread among the population and shared among the population. They lifted a lot of people out of poverty. They built 2 million homes, uh, education. I mean, their their track record is, uh, you know, really stellar, it seems to me, even, even with economic warfare being waged on them and all kinds of different meddling. Now, um, we have a strong lobby here, or a strong, say, faction of the 
a foreign policy establishment, if you will, people like Samantha Power, let's say, the humanitarian interventionists, if you will. So, like, how do they maneuver around this? Why isn't Samantha Power, I'm being facetious here, why isn't she calling you every day and, you know, trying to organize a uh, some pushback on this? Yeah, well, I think Samantha Power is a very good figure to focus on because she does represent uh, as you say, the da- the the religion, really, the bad religion of humanitarian interventionism, which in truth is nothing but imperialism dressed up, you know, uh, with human rights. And Samantha Powers in, is an interesting person because she got her, you know, big star, uh, her big claim to fame is her book about genocide um, called A Problem from Hell, which uh, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize. And the interesting thing about that book, which is a huge book, it weighs in at over a thousand pages, is that it doesn't talk about any any genocide committed by the United States, even though there's a number you could, you know, choose from if you wanted. The entire book was about how the U.S. didn't do enough to stop other people's genocides. Right. And so this the whole book was pro-interventionist. The whole book was premised on the idea that the U.S. is some uniquely good country that needs to intervene to stop uh, serious human rights abuses, including genocide, when in fact, probably the best way in the world to stop genocide is to keep U.S. troops at home, right? And to keep the U.S. military from backing things like the Saudi war in Yemen to get the U.S. to stop backing the uh, assault against the Congo, which has claimed about six million lives. And so but she ignores those things. She ignores also the U.S. war in Vietnam, which a number of people, including myself, view as a genocidal war, which claimed two to four million Vietnamese people. And so she is a perfect representation of this liberal obsession with the, with the idea that the U.S. goes around spreading democracy and human rights when, in fact, it's quite the opposite, when it undermines all those things. Jean Brickmont if he, has a great book called Humanitarian Imperialism, which is a very short book of about 100 pages, which goes through a lot of this. And as he said, you know um, – you have to start with the premise that the 82nd Airborne is not a human rights organization. Right, yeah. Which for many of us is an obvious fact, but it's not obvious for Samantha Bauer, you know, and she's been very critical in um, perpetuating uh, U.S. interventionist policy. Her her greatest work of art being the U.S. Uh, and NATO invasion of Libya, which she was very much behind, and which is you know, created a state of chaos in Libya and where slaves are now sold in, in, in slave markets in that country after that invasion. The other thing she did, by the way, not as famously, is she very much helped pave the way for the Saudi war in Yemen. Through, really? Yeah, her work in the Security Council. She was ambas- U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. And she actually helped uh, Deep Six a move of the Security Council to start uh, war crimes investigations into the war in Yemen. Uh And she intervened to stop that. So here is the great crusader against genocide helping pave the way for what may be the greatest genocide in 100 years. Yeah. And, you know, I remember I actually – you know, maybe even tweeted at her uh, during the whole thing in Yemen when she was in office, you know, asking her why she was not doing more about it. But she really got some blowback because as soon as she was out of, as soon as Obama was out of office, she started criticizing the Trump administration on Yemen. She suddenly became the humanitarian toward Yemen, which was, you know, it the hypocrisy in this country, particularly in the liberal establishment, is so incredible now that I th- I I often say we need a new superlative type word for it because it's just so over the top. But um, yeah, so she, you know she did that. She did come out 
now she pretends that she's a humanitarian toward Yemen too. I didn't realize she killed the investigation. That's interesting. Yeah, no, she's an incredible figure. And I, I've also noticed that she's now on the bandwagon against the war in Yemen. Uh, and it's incredible. Yeah. The hypocrisy is stunning. And, uh, and yet she'll continue to, uh, you know, get speaking engagements where she's paid, you know, uh, a huge amount of money to speak. And she'll continue to be able to teach at places like Harvard and get books published. And and not, very few people will call her out for for her, her hypocrisy. Yeah, she's she's one, I'd say, one of the main figures in discrediting the whole R2P and uh, humanitarian Thing because it's just, you know, nobody's buying it anymore. Now, to switch topics a little bit, the elections in Venezuela, first of all, you've observed a number of them, including the most recent one in May, which is the most, you know, the one at issue right now. Um, tell us, if you would, a little bit about your experience with that. Yes, well, yeah, I've observed you know, probably five, six different elections at least. Um, and yes, I did observe the most recent ones in May of 2018. And, you know, uh, what you're impressed with, first of all, is that they have an excellent actual voting system, which is uniform throughout the country. Of course, in the U.S., each state picks its own, you know, voting system, right? So you had that problem with the hanging chads in Florida, but only Florida because they, you know, had their own unique system. And then that's allowed for in the federal system in the U.S. With Chavez, Venezuela adopted a very good uniform system that every area, every uh, polling place uses where you have to use your fingerprint to even get the machine to turn on. And use an ID, a photo ID. The Republicans should love this, by the way. You know, yeah. you, need, you need to have that to prove that you're eligible to vote and to prevent you from voting uh, more than once. And then you go and you cast your electronic vote. And then the uh, machine prints out uh, a paper receipt of your electronic vote. And then you go put that piece of paper into a box. And by the end of the night, something like over, I think, 54 percent. How is it? 54 percent of, of, of boxes from each polling place are actually audited. They compare the paper receipts to the electronic results to make sure that they they match. So this is an incredible incredibly reliable system to the point that Jimmy Carter said it was the best electoral system in the world. So you have to start from that, that, I mean, no one really can credibly claim that the votes uh, or the vote counts are rigged somehow. So um, now are the polling, I'm sorry to interrupt you real quick, but now are there polling stations? Are they very accessible? Do people have to wait in long lines or is there any suppression in that sense? No, no. I mean, uh, sometimes there's long lines because a lot of people go to vote, you know, but everyone who's in line gets to vote eventually. And the polling places that I've observed are very orderly. And if people have to wait in line, they do so quite patiently. And some of the polling places are like uh, have a festival type atmosphere where food and drink is being sold and music's being played. So it's, you know a happy place to be. Right. Um, and now during, but yeah, they're very accessible for people. And, um, you know, in May of last year, so there was, uh, just to set the stage a bit. So you had Nicholas Maduro running against a bi- a guy from the business community named Henry Falcone, who, you know, was a legitimate opposition candidate who wanted to, amongst other, uh, things dollarize the economy and move to the U.S. dollar, which is very different than what Maduro wanted. The point being is you actually had, you know, a very real choice between those two candidates and, and other minor candidates, by the way. Um, interestingly, Donald Trump actually actually tried to pressure Falcone into not running. He threatened him with sanctions if he went 
went forward with running in the election because Trump had no interest, even in getting, you know, his guy uh, in power in Venezuela. He wanted to just delegitimize the entire electoral system. Was this because he knew he would lose? Uh, most likely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, because at that point that, their opposition was not well organized. It, well, yes, and a lot were calling for an abstention, calling for people to stay home. Okay. But the election did go forward with Falcone, and, and in truth, a lot of people did stay home. And so the uh, ultimately 46% of the electorate voted, which is not great, especially by Venezuelan standards, which since uh, Chavez became president, you know, he had very high turnout, you know, 65% or something. But, you know, and so I went to polling places where, you know, there were a lot of people standing in line, and I went to some particularly in wealthier communities where no one was coming, you know, because they were honoring the abstention. But that's their right to do. And people, as you know, abstain a lot in this country as well for various reasons. Right. Um, but that's how it goes. Um, and, but of the people who did vote, 67% uh, or around 6 million people did vote for Maduro. And no one really questions that. But all you hear is that uh, he was elected in a sham election, which is simply not true. Um, but that is stated in the mainstream press without any explanation. And it gives you the impression that he is as legitimate as is, is this Guaido character uh, to be president when it's absolutely not true. He, he stood for and was elected president in, in a very free and fair election. Um, and frankly, had the opposition decided to go to the polls, they might have been able to beat him. But they, you know, they made their own decision not to do that. So, yeah, my understanding is that the, the opposition has been fractured over over time. I saw someone mention that uh, with, you know, Juan Guaido, one of the notable things about this regime change operation is that. Yeah, the, uh, the opposition was able to come together. Um, so that's what made me think, oh, OK, so during the elections, they really couldn't get them to unify. Um, and, you know, this is a long term regime change operation. It's really you could say it's a 20 year slow burn, starting with the the coup in whatever it was, 2002 or three. But, you know, there's been an effort to undermine Venezuela all along. This isn't just a new a new thing i guess we all kind of know that but clearly since may by um by demanding that the opposition boycott the election you know they were already setting putting things in place so that they could convince other people that this other countries that this was you know not a, a legitimate election yeah absolutely i mean that was the goal that, as you say, that's been the goal for a long time, really, since Chavez was became president in 1999. By the way, this week marks the 20th anniversary of his uh, coming to power. And yes, yeah, since that time, the U.S. has been trying in very different ways to uh, undermine and overthrow uh, the Chavez Maduro governments. And as you mentioned, it was successful for a couple days in 2002. Uh, when Chavez was kidnapped by elements in the military and taken to an island, and the opposition did gain power for a couple of days um, until the people came down from the mountains and said, we, we want Chavez back, and he was brought back. Interestingly, if you want to look for symbolism, Chavez was kidnapped on uh, Good Friday, and uh, he was brought back to power on uh, Easter Sunday. So, oh, you're uh, kidding. Why, did, yeah. why didn't they realize that that— that was <laughs> yeah yeah the the you know uh um uh, yeah biblical overtures are quite amazing if you ever see the movie and i recommend it i've seen it a number of times and it's quite instructive uh the revolution will not be televised which was by this irish film crew who just happened to be filming chavez and filming inside uh the presidential palace when the coup happened uh, and you get this insider's view of what happened. It's a really amazing film, and they're there when he comes back, too. And there is this scene, again, very uh, reminiscent of uh, 
of the first Easter where Chavez is brought out uh, from the presidential palace as he's being led away and people are sobbing, crying. And he's like, don't worry, I'll be back. And it's just, it, it's very emotional, you know. Um, but anyways, that movie is very worth seeing to see the nature of Chavez, to see the nature of the opposition and to see the nature of the poor who came out to to bring Chavez back into power. Right, right. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't realize that they uh, they deposed him on, you know, on Good Friday, left themselves open for that. I mean, gee, isn't this a mostly Catholic country? Yes, yes. And believe me, people in Venezuela are very aware of that. Yeah. Um, now, let me see. What's the best way to approach? I I did not see that movie, though it has been recommended to me. I will watch that. But I, I did see a shorter documentary by, uh, is it Greg Palast, um, where he actually talks to Chavez. And uh, so I did see that one, but I... I will make a point to watch the other one. Um, uh, while we're on the topic of, you know, good references, since it is so hard to find, you know, valid information, just, you know, the real, real information, particularly the other side of the story, if you will. Um, who else should, should we look to read or watch or um, just some other references, if you would, besides yourself, of course. Yeah, well, I, I think Venezuela Analysis is excellent, which is an online publication which prints every day uh, news and information about Venezuela. Um, Counterpunch is very good, I think, as well. Uh, Telesur, and, and there's Telesur English and Spanish, um, also is very good on these types of subjects. Uh, Mint Press is actually quite interesting and right. good on, the, on these types of subjects. Um, that's probably enough to get you going anyway. Right. Right. And, um, if you would, you've got three books in the past year. Looks like a trilogy of sorts. Um, yes. 2017, you have the plot to scapegoat Russia, how the CIA and the deep state have conspired to vilify Putin. And then in 2018, you have the plot to attack Iran, how the CIA and the deep state have conspired to vilify Iran. And then most recently, just a couple of uh, months ago, the plot to control the world, how the U.S. spent billions to change the outcome of elections around the world. And uh, that was pretty prescient. <laughs> I'll read just <laughs> yeah, uh, a couple of um, paragraphs from the, the intro uh, online there. In one, it says, as politicos and pundits wring their hands about alleged Russian collusion and meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, Dan Kavalik reminds us that the U.S. has been meddling in other countries' elections and democratic processes for decades and with terrible results. And then another paragraph says, the plot to control the world details these instances of U.S. interference and other instances of meddling in other countries' democratic processes such as Nicaragua, Haiti, Venezuela, Greece, the Congo, Honduras, and even in Russia in the very recent past. These examples put the current allegations against Vladimir Putin and Russia into historical context and challenge the reader to consider that if the U.S. does not want other countries to interfere in its elections, it may be high time for the U.S. to stop its interference in other countries around the world. Now, I mean... One of the big points you're making here, first of all, I can't wait to read this book because I, get, I have a lot of catching up to do on. I, I was alive through a lot of these things, but it was a, you know, I was in my late teens and my 20s and just not keeping up on this kind of thing. And you mentioned in one of your interviews that your students, you know, just don't seem to know about the things that we've done wrong. Uh, they sort of it sort of gets omitted in our in our history lessons. But um yeah, I I definitely want to read these, but the the bigger point that you're making, uh, which this whole RussiaGate thing just puts in stark relief, and the whole world, you know, frankly, Dan has to be like laughing hysterically when they see the the freak out about anyone meddling in our elections. I mean, it, we must be the laughing stock of the world. Yes, well, it's funny. Noam Chomsky said exactly the same thing. That yeah, when they hear that. 
the claim that Putin somehow swung the election for Trump. He says, you know, the whole world has a collective laugh, which is absolutely true. And, you know, and interestingly, uh, there were uh, at least two polls I know taken, you know, one, one, one year, one in another year, I think 2016. And then again, in 2017, this was a poll taken worldwide of 6,000 people in 60 different countries. And, um, the question was, you know, what country is the greatest threat to world peace? And um, by far, the number one answer was the United States. Twenty five percent of the people polled said the United States. And so the world has a very different view of the U.S. than Americans do. You know, the world uh, by now is on to to us. They know the U.S. is not promoting peace and democracy throughout the world. They know they're right. on. The U.S. is undermining. But we live in this bubble. You know, where we believe still largely Americans believe that we are this beacon of 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 democracy and freedom in the world. And um, but again, most of the world does not buy that if they ever did. Now, it seemed like, you know, in the 80s and 90s or actually, sorry, in the I guess maybe late 70s and 80s. I mean, we were in overdrive in trying to meddle in Central and South American countries, but then, like, it seemed to calm down, and, you know, the BRICS rose up in, in recent years, and um, some more uh, Bolivarian-type governments came into power, and it seemed like there was a sea, sea change in the whole region until just a couple of years ago, you know, everything seemed to wave back to the other back to uh, the other way. Now, I guess it's to be expected that there would be action and reaction would happen. But now, during this time when it seemed like we weren't meddling so much, I mean, did we sort of lay off or was it more covert or did we take a different approach? Like what was going on during those years? Yeah, well, I think there's a consensus that after 9-11, the U.S. really did focus much more on the Middle East and much less on Latin America, much to the benefit of Latin America, (laughs) you know, that Latin America uh, to its benefit was forgotten by the U S for several years for the most part. And and that we weren't as heavily engaged in, in, in regime change operations. And I think now people see uh, that the U S Uh, has increasingly gotten involved in Latin America and that now may be really shifting uh, from the Middle East back to Latin America. Uh, In fact, there is a good, I think this was in Mint Press as well, good article, uh, and the title was Goodbye Middle East, you know, and um, Hello to the Destruction of Latin America, essentially saying that Trump is is decided to pull troops out of places like Afghanistan and Syria only to, you know, prepare them for operations in Latin America. And I think there may be some truth to that. I think the appointment of John Bolton uh, to national security advisor and uh, Mike Pompeo as secretary of state. Now, of course, Elliot Abrams, Jesus, yeah, special advisor to Venezuela may signal this, that, that now the U.S. has decided, oh, We've been asleep in Latin America too long, and now China has some influence there, and now Russia has some influence, and it's time to assert the Monroe Doctrine um, again. Not that it was ever, you know, renounced, but I think they feel they didn't aggressively defend the Monroe Doctrine uh, enough, and now now they're going to do that. Now, um, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that you have a chance to make whatever points you think are most important for people to know. But I am interested in what your take is and where, where you see this going, because I read an article in Time magazine by uh, former Admiral Stavridis, right? Guy that really never met a war he didn't like. He was um, a commander of Southcom, I think uh, 2006 to nine, somewhere around there. And he, um, you know, he, spouts out all the the usual you know negative stuff about Venezuela but at the end he recommends not no military intervention and he talks about how um, even our best allies in Latin America are extremely suspicious 
and will push back, you know, greatly. And that it will, it'll just be a disaster if we decide to use military force. I'm personally not confident that the, the current people in power, now that Trump seems to have handed everything over to the worst faction of neoconservatives and other war hawks, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not confident that they will heed that. But if you want, and I know people don't like to predict or speculate, but what's your best guess on how this is going to play out? Yes. Well, and I, by the way, I heard him as well on NPR on Sunday, uh, the Sunday evening NPR uh, as well. So he, I guess he's making the rounds these days that, that ammo. I think direct U.S. military intervention is, is probably unlikely. I see it as a last resort for the U.S. for the reason that you just said. I just think the optics are terrible and it may cause more blowback for the U.S. than not. Uh, but I also think that the people running the show are, uh, for lack of a better word, crazy. I mean, I don't think these are rational people we're talking about. Yeah, um, I don't think that's too strong. I think it's true. I mean, you have a guy like John Bolton who's also openly advocated to attack Iran, which would be complete insanity. And, you know, I think he's capable of anything. Yeah. Um, Trump seems to be capable of anything and in, in, in anything, depending on the day. Right. So I, I, I don't think it could be ruled out, you know, but I think they're going to try everything first, short of that. And they're going to try to see if this economic strangulation is going to work and political isolation. Uh, I think if that doesn't work, I think they may look to use proxies like the Colombian and Brazilian military yeah. to do something. Um, and then I think, again, a U.S. military force would be the last resort. Um, so I, I don't know. If I were a betting man, I'd say, I, I'd say that I'd bet against direct U.S. military intervention. And again, the admiral, former admiral you quoted said he thought there was a, only a 25 percent chance of direct U.S. military invention, intervention, which is still pretty high. Uh, but that sounds about right to me. I think that percentage is probably about right. Yeah, I mean, I could see them funneling weapons and support for, you know, any kind of mercenary proxy they can get. And, you know, now with the situation in Colombia and Brazil being drastically different than it used to be you know they could act like turkey as a you know uh, the rat lines for weapons and fighters could come through there and uh i'm not sure how well venezuela is able to police their borders they've got huge borders right they um, can't yeah they've shown they can't you know yeah. it's, it's it's very difficult yeah yeah i mean i hope that doesn't happen but that seems to be the way we do things now so um you know, we've seen it play out a lot of times. But as you said before, the curtain is definitely pulled back more now. People are really, because they, they use the same kind of game plans over and over again. I don't know if it's CIA running it or if corporate, corporate mercenaries. It's hard to tell now that, for instance, you know, 70% of the intelligence budget is privatized now. So, I mean, you just never know who is operating. And you have the oil companies. And God, I mean... Who knows? They could have a whole um, mercenary army of their own for all we know. But um, I've kept you a long time, but I do want to make sure that you are able to, if you like, you know, just put across some points that you think are like the most important things for our, our audience to take away from this or maybe suggest some types of actions that you think might be, you know, effective, uh, even though our government doesn't listen to us very much anymore. But uh you know, if you would, please um, wrap it up in any way you like. Yeah, well, the one thing I would say is that, look, we need to organize a peace movement again. You know, we, we've we had various times very strong peace movements, you know, really through the 60s, really up until uh, the attack on Iraq in 2003. We had a peace movement you could always count on to come out in the streets in big numbers and oppose U.S. wars abroad. And and then once we started the war in Iraq in 2003, that kind of disappeared and really hasn't come back. While you certainly have a, some foment in the United States right now, and you have protest movements 
on a range of issues and very important issues. You know, you do not have foment in protest around U.S. wars, even though any issue you can pick is negatively impacted by U.S. wars abroad, right? We've spent $6 trillion at least on wars in the Middle East since, uh, since 1990, I think it was. $6 trillion. Yeah. That's $6 trillion that isn't being spent on hunger relief here, that isn't being built on roads, that isn't being built on trains, right? So all the social issues you care about they're all being destroyed because of these wars, and yet there's that connection rarely being made. And in addition, of course, when you send all these people abroad, all these soldiers abroad, uh, many of them die. Many of them come back physically injured and or mentally injured. And so you create even more social problems on top of the money you're spending. You know, you're destroying families. You're destroying the social fabric of the country by training people to kill and and by bringing them back broken. And so all of these problems that we're experiencing in this country, war is a major cause of them. And we need to focus on that. We need to oppose U.S. intervention everywhere in the, in the world. And we have to, to say, hey, why don't we fix our own democracy why don't we fix our own broken infrastructure exactly and let the world develop the way it wants to you know that that is the message that i would have for people yeah shift your focus this is a root problem you know learn more about it and um and you'll see i mean you'll see that it's a root problem and a lot of other things could improve you know if we focus on this yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that a lot. Um, I'd like to reach out to you again in, in the future because now that I see what your background is, I mean, you have so much to share with uh, people who are interested and, you know, need to know about it. So hopefully we'll talk again in the future. But if you would, tell people where they can find your work, your books, and how they can support you. Well, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me on. I'd love to come back again. Um, I write a lot for Counterpunch. You can find a lot of my writings there. Uh, I've written for Huffington Post as well. You can find a lot of my writings uh, there in terms of buying my books. You can get them uh, at most Barnes & Noble. If they're not on the shelf, you can have them order it. It, You can get them at most independent bookstores. You can also order them on Amazon. Yeah, so you can find find those books pretty much uh, everywhere. And I continue to write uh, regularly again, particularly for Counterpunch. Great, great. Again, thank you so much, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Joanne. Really appreciate it. And that's our show. Thank you for listening. A special thanks to Dan Kovalik. Find his work at Counterpunch and Huffington Post. Look for his informative interviews at various alternative media channels. Follow him on Twitter at Daniel M. Kavalik. The Around the Empire podcast is independent media. Your support is really important. Please pitch in at patreon.com slash around the empire or do one-time donations via PayPal at paypal.me slash around the empire pod. You can find these links on our website, aroundtheempire.com. The syndicated audio podcast has been the main focus for Around the Empire, and that's where we get the bulk of our traffic. We're on most podcast apps like iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher. So please subscribe to us there, and if you like us, click the stars and give us a good review. It helps with ranking and visibility. I'd like to expand the content for Around the Empire this year, add some new kinds of content like video streams, other video mini docs. And for this, I'll need to hire some freelance creatives and also we need to build out the YouTube channel to get more subscribers. So find the link for our YouTube channel or just youtube.com slash around the empire. And if you would hit the red subscribe button, it's free, doesn't bother you with notifications unless you want them, then you click the bell icon. 
Also, if you like the videos on YouTube, press the thumbs up icon to like the individual videos. Follow us on Twitter at Around the Empire. See you next time. Take care, everyone.